trying to slam me? Come on, Bill, I'm a big fan of yours. Get off the bus. Get out of control. Why not do something crazy? It makes a hell of a lot more sense than blowing your brains out. Go ahead and get some FCC, you know what that means? This phone call has been traced. This is my life you're screwing around with here, you know? Not anymore, it isn't. This is everyone's life. Mark, you can't leave it like this. You out there? You listening? Welcome to Lush Future. Um, this is episode eight, uh, our interview with James Evan Pilato. Uh, James Evan Pilato is the webmaster of MediaMonarchy.com. He is the host and DJ of Pump Up the Volume. He's also a uh, co-host with James Corbett on uh, New World Next Week, a weekly news show. Also, he is an on-air talent at 101.9 Kink in Portland. Uh, we got a couple questions today just regarding uh, the, the the current state of the music industry, and he's got the perfect background to do it. Uh, Media Monarchy uh, bills itself as uh, a commercial-free outlet for news and culture. Um, so thank you so much for, for, for coming on the show today, J- uh, James. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, let's... Uh, let's I guess uh, not sure if everybody's familiar with you, but but uh, could, if you wouldn't mind, could you describe uh, and and how long have you been doing Pump Up the Volume, and uh, how long have you been in radio? I've been doing Pump Up the Volume since March of 2012, so almost three years. But I've been doing Media Monarchy since September of 2005. And I've been doing radio in some way, shape, or form, whether it was internet or pirate or terrestrial or podcast or you name it, since 95. When I went to, when I first went to college, I actually started to work at the college radio station there and pretty much did it the whole time I lived in that town. It was a little 950 watt non commercial radio station run kind of under the auspices of the college which gives it kind of a leeway in a way because it's meant to be educational for the most part people are like yeah it's the it's the students who you know who cares what they do so that for me was kind of my great education and playground to do a lot of things and even as the time that I was there was sort of pre and post 911 and sort of post 911 I started to kind of put in a lot more kind of counterculture and politics and and sort of 911 truth issues With the stuff that I was doing at the college radio station, doing a lot more collage-y things and mixing kind of news and music. So I moved out to Portland in 2005 and basically was in a new spot and was really excited and turned on by all the sort of online media. So kind of had the idea of doing a blog and it just started out as Media Monarchy and I was just kind of posting news stories but once I was kind of gainfully employed and was able to kind of do extracurricular things out here in Portland, I started to immediately do a weekly Media Monarchy show. And I did it from a, a pirate and internet station here in Portland called the Portland Radio Authority. And I would do the show every Friday morning at 10 a.m. here Pacific time. And I did that for several years, probably about six years, I think. And with Doing that, it just sort of slowly built and grew, and I started to cover all kinds of different areas under Media Monarchy and pump up the volume. The music show was just sort of one part of that, because to me, music has always been my biggest love. So even though I may have gotten involved in sort of political radio and things, music is always my love, and that's something I'm always going to want to be involved with. So the pump up the volume music shows was sort of the natural outgrowth of covering all sorts of things under the under the Media Monarchy umbrella. Awesome, man. And uh, I mean, it's it's weekly. Is it what, what day of the week? 
Ah, uh, that's that's what's funny is in doing <laughs> podcasts, you you sort of set the you you can set the goals, but you know that if something else in your life happens, you, it's not live for the most part. That's kind of the difference. I remember I always, that. I've always liked doing live stuff because it keeps me on a deadline and it makes me do work. I think that's why I've always liked doing live radio and even live theater. I, I did a lot of back in college just because I like the idea that, hey, 8 o'clock, curtain's going up. You better be ready because it's going to happen. Mm. But doing right. podcasts, you know, I, I, for the most part, put out Pump Up the Volume every weekend, which is sort of tied in with the way that I actually build the episodes. Right. Oh, nice. Well, so, I, I yeah, I basically shouldn't even have asked that question because this episode is supposed to be out like a month ago. So it's, it's a okay. Um, all right, man. Well, I, so, so pop up the volume. I, I'm not gonna lie. You've showed me so much just fantastic music. I mean, just to, to name a few over the past like couple of weeks, uh, I, the, your tail end of 2014 was fantastic, man. I, I have to commend you for it. It was super good. I mean, I had never heard of, I never knew of Sylvan Esso. I never knew of Smokey Brights. I never knew of, Oh geez, so many, so many fantastic artists. I mean, I think the the, the Budos band. I think at some point. I mean, it's just so many good good uh, pieces of, of music. There's such a wide spectrum uh, from from the the different vocalists, the different whether it's punk. Occasionally, it's like it's it's kind of it seems to hit the the whole spectrum really. So as far as both like genre and message, actually, in terms of the lyrics, you should be run the jewels. Run the jewels was fantastic, man. Um, so how do you, how do you seek out new music or are there like kind of standard sources or mailing lists or anything? It's, I think for me, like I said, it's always just somewhat been kind of an intrinsic thing that I do. I basically grew up. So it's all, it's funny when you reach a certain age and you can kind of look back and you can see the things that you've done or been involved with or whatever situations throughout your life and go, Oh, it totally makes sense that I'm doing a, B and C. Now the, all the pieces are there when you look back at it. I had kind of a conservative Christian upbringing and was kept away from music and movies for a while and not super duper strict, but for the most part, didn't go to movies and couldn't buy music. But I was then suddenly able to around 10 or 11 at like in like 1987, 1988 was pretty much when the, when the dam broke. This was also the point with home video and home video rental stores, VHS tapes. And I spent a bunch of time because I lived in a small town in southern West Virginia and the mall was 15 minutes away. That's where the bookstore and the record store and the movie theater was. And Mm -hmm. so I basically would, you know, I I mowed lawns and delivered papers and worked at restaurants through, you know, junior high and high school, basically to make money to go to the mall on the weekend to buy books and records and see movies. But. You know, it was so kept away from that when the dam broke and I was able, I spent a bunch of time in record stores and I spent a bunch of time in in video stores looking at boxes and looking at liner notes and just kind of studying all that stuff. And all of that stuff was somehow kind of stuck in my head. I've always been good with remembering all of those kind of things, like somebody would probably be with like baseball stats or what what Hmm. have you. But... I was always excited about seeking out new music. So again, pre-internet and living in a small town, actually MTV had a show called 120 Minutes back in the 80s and 90s. Sunday nights at midnight, and they played alternative music. And they were doing it, you know, in the in the late 80s before we were even really calling it, you know, kind of alternative. I don't even know that they were using that that word for it. <laughs> but it had a lot of British stuff. It had a lot of independent stuff. And this was right as you know, Pixies and a lot of, uh, all that kind of stuff was blowing up all sort of pre Nirvana. And so between things like 120 minutes and in any kind of cool magazines I could get my hands on, I, I guess the shortest answer is I always had to work hard to keep up with music and culture that I was excited about. So now that it's maybe, I guess it went through a period where you could get everything and now you can get everything, but still people it's all, it's too much. Now the whole thing is, is curation. Right. That's what all the big wigs and all the biggest companies are now going, Oh crap. Anybody can stream anything and all the art and music and culture is available at the touch of a button, but no one knows how to find the things they like. I think I've always been good. And, and, and again, it's been a passion of sort of curating music and culture for people. I've always gotten a huge buzz out of, you know, somebody in my life, friend, family, coworker, whoever, who may like something that I'd probably be like, yeah, yeah, that's kind of boring and and kind of mainstream. Hey, have you tried? 
I like sort of giving them the the alternative because if I know that you like A B, I can guess that you might like C and give you know they take a shot on it. So whether that's and, you know and, controversial ideas or or records or movies, I've always just been really into doing that, and I used to make best of the year mixtapes and I did it on cassette hmm. tapes and then I did it on CDs when you could make, you know, CD mixes, which weren't <laughs> as much fun because you weren't sort of mashing things up. It was really just right. kind of playing song after song. So right. then through the radio station and then starting to do the podcast. So now doing mix shows and doing new music shows and doing best of the year kind of shows. It's all just kind of been, I guess, second nature to me. That's awesome. Are, are, are there any particular features that you seek uh, as, as speci- specifically in terms of like whether or not you want to broadcast it or rebroadcast or show it to new people or tell, tell people about it? Well, I guess to answer your question about pump up the volume, it's a really because I started doing it while I was doing still the Media Monarchy show. So I was already doing another whole two hour weekly show that required all kinds of research with the news and the clips and all those things. And I did hundreds of episodes of Media Monarchy. So because it was, you know, another show I was trying to do on top of all the other things and top of just being a regular person with a life and all of those things, what was the easiest way I could put together a show that had new music? And I knew I couldn't, you know, hem and haul and wonder about what I liked most or what was coolest or, you know, what to... Uh, I basically knew and and was already a fan of there was a handful of of podcasts to put it you know lightly they weren't produced shows but basically there were song of the day podcasts that you could subscribe to RSS feed or you I think maybe they even have it some of them have it set up through iTunes but there was a couple mm. of cool non-commercial radio stations around the country that offered a song of the day podcast and KEXP out of Seattle and KCRW out of Santa Monica were the two that I always followed. Monday through Friday, each day, they would put out a song. Hmm. And so it kind of struck me because I dug those songs because they're basically, by the, by the nature of what those stations are, they're always right. brand, it's always brand new music. So I wondered if there were more, if there were other stations that did that. So searching and hunting and finding there were some that were kind of half-assed at it or they had stopped doing it, but I found finally a handful of stations that really did it consistently and did it Monday through Friday. So it started out being basically KEXP, KCRW, and the Minnesota public radio station called The Current. I would Hmm. take those three internet feeds, subscribe to those, get the songs that they each put out, and it would basically be, that's 15 songs. Maybe dump, I, I forget exactly, you know, maybe I would originally kind of play them all, and I think I would even kind of play them in the order of the way they kind of came out. As mm-hmm. again, another way just to sort of take it out of my hands and not go, oh gosh, what's the best order? Or how do these things right. all work together? It was like, nope, it's all sort of decided. I just sort of recompile it and reconfigure it. I I, I feel very similarly with, with uh, I don't know, on, on Twitter, I'm sure you notice, I will just often be like, I'll, I take the train to and from work every day. So I'll like, I got an hour to kill. I'll just be, I, I have a little news feeder thing that I've set up before and, and it's kind of out there at like uh, Jet News, but it's like .ws. But uh, I'll just, uh, same kind of thing. It's like you almost allow yourself to be a bit of a conduit where it's like, I know that these are relatively interesting like they're, these are pieces of interesting content, whether it's music or, or uh, news or whatever. And I don't necessarily know if I'm the best gauge for the value of all of these pieces independently. And so it's like I kind of almost want to just say, like, I'm pretty sure these make the cut and and kind of, I guess, at that point, like, it's up to you to decide. If you don't like it, I won't be offended. That's OK. Um, but but uh, do, you, do you ever select tracks that, like, you personally don't necessarily like, I guess, or more specifically, like, listen to? on your own when you just pick what you get to listen to, but you think are of a certain quality or talent. Every week, every episode Word. of Pump Up the Volume has something that'd be like, eh, maybe not, okay. but, but I feel like it's still, I like, I like sort of the, I mean, when it comes down to it, it is a broad mix of music, but a lot of it is sort of, it is kind of a lot of college rock kind of music. Cause again, by the nature of it, it's coming from somewhat college rock kind of sources. 
but there's still enough kind of weird world music and a lot of just kind of local scene music from different points around the country. So as the years have gone by, I've added on and maybe other stations have started up since I've been doing this, but I can now source, there's a station out of Austin called KUTX. They put out a song a week, or, or rather a song a day, five a week. And there's one out of Philly that you know called The Key, WXPN. They do it. Mm-hmm. They do it in a slightly different way. Sometimes they just send out links to you know things that are part of like a World Cafe NPR, and it's sort of like, ah, eh, if that's like an NPR thing, those I usually skip because it's to me it's sort of like, ah, eh, that that's already somebody else's like radio show because they performed it on that show. When it's just brand new <laughs> tracks and MP3s, I you know I to me it's not as sort of strange to to share it, I guess. But I yeah. I pick stuff you know that I wouldn't maybe be in love with. But I think as it's as it's gone by and maybe it hits different levels and hits different strides, you know, I'm probably a lot more apt lately to dump any kind of slower folky or so it's like, oh, I got five minutes. Hell with that. I'm not I'm not including that and trying to make it actually a little different than the way it started and not so much rigidly sort of structured but now I do pick and choose, and I am actually kind of mixing and remixing the songs a lot more. So as far as the transitions and some of the sequencing and things, I am putting a lot more thought into that and being a lot more quick, you know, like I said, just be like, nope, dump that song, dump that song. But all the links and all those things are all still out there. And I, and again, I love just sort of sharing the info and giving the links to say, here's this band, here's how you can go learn about them. I'm not trying to rip them off. I'm not trying to steal their music or, you know, share it. These are MP3s that are already promotionally out there. The only reason those stations are tweeting them out is because the band or the label said, yes, absolutely, this is the promotional single, you can share it. So again, I don't feel it's not something like, ha ha ha, I'm stealing and, and bootlegging music. It's stuff that's all already publicly available. I'm just sort of curating it and remixing it and putting it out. And again, hopefully trying to always give credit to, you know, KEXP, KCRW, KUTX, XPN, and, and MPR. MPR. <laughs> I was going to say for a second there. <laughs> um, that's uh that that's that's really cool man. Yeah, no, it's as you mentioned earlier there's just so there's such like a deluge of just like there's so many good bands. That's that's really the tr- like the I really believe that there really are so many really really good bands out there producing just fantastic music and not even necessarily ones you would they would describe themselves as a band. It's probably just a couple people that can make some just interesting music. Um and it's it's really pretty pretty cool but how so so how do you go about like selecting tracks that fit like other others tastes uh, ones that you not, don't necessarily think are yours that's that's a funny thing and that's something that probably gets me i don't know if it gets me into trouble but maybe sometimes limits limits my my reach or exposure sometimes in that i maybe don't care as much about what my audience may may or may not want there's a little bit of a like this is shit that I dig and I'm going to share it. You might not love all of it. I don't really expect you to love all of it, but I'm putting it together in a hopefully an interesting and passionate way that you can still, you know, not throw the baby out with the bathwater, basically. Um, you know, again, the you know, I, I do news. So basically the pump up the volume episodes for folks that haven't checked them out. And of course the links and all that stuff, you can get everything on mediamonarchy.com. It's basically, you know, It starts off with a new song, immediately come in and kind of introduce the show, and then, you know, it's basically a couple of three-song sets, you know, back sell, front sell, and give you the info, and, you know, the show notes have all the links and their record label and and their Twitter accounts and all all the links and things for you to, you know, to go get excited about some band. But at the end, I kind of cover, you know, a bit of news that's of the previous week. And in there, it's like, I can't cover all the news. I basically cover news and bands of stuff that I'm interested in, or at least are sort of overarchingly kind of culturally interesting. So I pretty much, as you and I are talking right now, the the next Pump Up the Volume episode 145 is totally in the can. I'm looking at it right here. It's in, you know, it's in my... I'm adding all the tags and things to the finished MP3 right now. So it'll go up in the next in the next little while. But it's all on there, and, and it's all, you know, it it takes the sort of steps 
I, I but I was going to say I mentioned mentioned the Grammys at the end because of course the the Grammys are this weekend and there will be you know a handful of interesting things on there because that's like I said you know that's kind of a big culturally interesting thing and would mention news about you know, oh holy shit you know Suge Knight's probably going to jail forever now because he ran some dudes over with his car. Those kind of big music news. But other than that, it's like, hey, Built a Spill says they have a new record coming out or so and so. And for yeah, for the most part, it's stuff that I'm that I dig. OK. All right. Because I I was actually really curious because I to a large degree, I don't necessarily think we have the same sense of, of music. But there's often so much stuff that I would have never even known to ask for that I'll find in your in your 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 productions that are just like, like, whoa, thanks. And And to your point, as far as like. You're not ripping them off. Of course, you're not. You're, you're you're linking back to them. You're promoting them. You're you're giving them yet yet one more like angle of exposure. I mean, to me, it seems like that's I would not know about these bands like Deerhoof. The, like you're you're. I wasn't sure. I thought you were doing some crazy audio crazy audio editing at the end of that last Deerhoof track. Deerhoof Deerhoof track. It doesn't even sound right. Um, and in and I believe you're you. I uh, it's just so such a strange name. Uh, the I think entertainment. Um, I forget what, what episode number, I'm sorry. That's, that's my fault. I'll, I'll link it up. But, but I, I thought you were doing crazy audio editing and no, that was just the track. Like that was just, I ended up like listening to it on my own and you, you do do some very cool blending and actually just, it seems like what you pick makes that even, even stranger. Um, but, but you led actually perfectly into to exactly what I wanted to chat to you about, uh, chat with you about, uh, as far as current culture, there's there's such a huge transition and, and you had mentioned like just doing mixtapes and, and sharing and, and finding media, like finding music back in the day. I, you said you grew up in a relatively like kind of conservative, uh, or at least, I don't know, not totally exposed to music. My, my mom took me to see Rage Against the Machine when I was 10 years old. So it was a very different type of uh, context there. But that said, um, the way that it's changed, like back then, like you, you would buy a CD still. And that was when like, you'd be like upset because you accidentally bought it at Walmart and they edited out all the bad words. And you're like, what the hell happened? Like, so, but, but, but nowadays it, I feel like maybe to some degree, as far as the seeking it out and all that kind of stuff is almost plateaued with, with the internet and kind of like a more ubiquitous way, format, at least to, to search for, for different kind of content like that. Uh, what's, what's your, like, a, a kind of, tertiary related somewhere in between what's what's your opinion on the the current state of the music industry man i think there are moments where like a, maybe a lot of the other sort of corporate dinosaur media there are moments where it's like man it's about to crumble any day now because they it still operates in such a sort of unsustainable way i mean i'm shocked to this day how many record labels send cd singles into the radio station. It's like, you guys produce a seat like with the plat and the jewel case. And it's like, what a waste of time and money and resources. Like, it's not even the album with 10 songs on it. So the fact that they still kind of operate in that way makes me like, man, you guys are doomed and you get what you deserve. And I think a lot of it really has changed and maybe it really will continue to where there'll be two or three mega major companies that pretty much run stuff and the sheep who, you know, love that stuff will always love that stuff. But then on the flip side, there'll be just a million different content producers. I think comedians in some way have actually kind of become one of the bigger kind of cultural kind of movements or for lack of a better word, like front line kind of, that's where a lot of it comes from. And it's all the dudes who, have been doing stand-up and writing and comedy for, for a couple of decades, but they were quick adopters of the web and social media and podcasting, most importantly. And they've kind of taken that over, and then it, it struck me at some point, it's like, man, and those guys aren't... They're not tied into some seven-album deal with Sony Epic Records, and you've got to do this and this... They're making what they want to do for the most part, and they're all being go like, yeah, I'm going to do this show and give it to Comedy Central, take it or leave it. They're not going to tell me how to make the show, and I'm going to stock it with all my friends and buddies who have been doing you know, media with forever. I see that as kind of a big change. But I also I, see I, from working at, you know, working at a commercial radio station, there's definitely the note they know that a lot of people, and I have to even sort of say to them that it's like, yeah, I mean, I stopped listening to commercial radio 20 years ago. 
And if you want to try and get, you know, dudes even close to something like me, you know, listening back to the radio, here's some of the things you want to try and kind of get into. So, in, I mean, in one way, it's still super dominant as far as, you know, everybody loves the Grammys, everybody loves the same handful of songs and the same ha- kind of handful of media. But then on the other hand, it's totally shifted and it's totally changed in ways that I think, again, kind of the slow dinosaur media is going to keep kind of crumbling as they keep trying to yeah. kind of grab. But, you know, that might be optimistic of me. I, yeah, I it, it definitely seems at, at least in a lot of these different aspects of, of, of many different things, not even necessarily just related to the music industry, it, it seems to be this transition of kind of... I don't know, cutting down the middleman as far as going from like the producer, distributor, retailer type system to like the, you can just be like a one man shop. Like you see like Jack Conti. I don't know if you've you've heard that name, but he, he was the guy that started Patreon and he like used to do these like video audio tracks and that were fantastic. And he would just do it cooped up in his room with a ton of instruments. Just he wanted to put it out there. And there's, there's something beautiful about that. And I guess I'm, I'm also curious, like, how do you think, how do you feel like self-promotion via the internet has, has changed the experience of the average listener? So, like, not necessarily from the producer standpoint, but the, the listeners, I think it's definitely changed that as well, wouldn't you say? It has, and I, it was only when you said, once you said Patreon, and I was like, oh, yeah, exactly. And I, and you know, and I've had friends who, who know that I'm in, I've been in a weird kind of one foot in one foot out for the last couple of years of wanting to just do media monarchy but also enjoying the steady paycheck and getting to you know do radio you know and it's pretty easy for the most part because it's like I said it's all kind of second nature to me but it's in service of a lot of things that I may not really want to be connected to or involved with and my buddy was like man you got to set up a patreon account like that'll really help you get to the point where I've been kind of fixated on this idea again for the last couple of years of, dude, if I could get a thousand people to give me a dollar a month, I would pretty <laughs> much <yeah>. be <laughs> able to do media monarchy full time and would basically put out content every single day. And I think Patreon would be, is one of those ways that, that again, maybe, maybe to go back to the, to the previous talk of, you know, one, two or three big monolithic companies and yeah, and the rest of us, well, they'll just be a million different brands and channels because it's going to, we're almost now to the point where we all our own self-promotion. We all are, you know, we're our own kind of brands and, and media outlets. And that's, I mean, in some way it seems insane. And then in other ways, I'm like, damn, I'm totally behind on trying to set up and, and be sustainable of just doing media monarchy. I I know I I think I'd be surprised I I don't know I'd be surprised at the same time next year we had a similar conversation and you didn't have a thousand I I you deserve far more than that in my opinion but that's biased clearly so <laughs> but, uh, uh, so so do you, like do you think that just the existence of the internet has changed or I guess not necessarily the existence, but the current state of it and the kind of the abilities that that are granted to just the average person thereof. Do you think that that's affected how artists create music? Maybe even before they start kind of laying it down? Yeah, absolutely. So here, here's maybe even an example on on the upcoming episode of pump up the volume episode one forty five. Um, we're calling it hot foot. (laughs) You, you heard it first. Um, (laughs) In I'm there tweet it right now. is uh, <laughs> there's a new sort of promotional single that basically these dudes are trying to put together a Bee Gees tribute album, and they've only got a little bit of the work laid down, so they put out a song as the sort of flagship promotional thing to be like, yo, you know, help us fund the rest of this because isn't this song you know so awesome? So I once I and again because I kind of put together and do the research for each of the each of the bands just so in the middle of the episodes I can say hey that's the London band and their third album blah blah blah. In do, in doing the research of that I was like oh this record doesn't even exist yet. This is just the <laughs> promotional single for you know a to be announced release. Pro- I mean probably in 2015 one way or the other they'll do it. I think they're running the Kickstarter to if they can you know chop off you know half of the the funding and be able to take care of it. But so that for me is an example of the way it's sort of changed that now you have, like you were saying, cutting out the middleman in some way, you know, 
there's still a sort of Kickstarter, PayPal, banking system middleman that is still involved in some way, and I don't think we've f- quite figured out the way to get around that yet until we finally get, you know, maybe Bitcoin is some kind of, you know, peer-to-peer exchange of, of goods and, and services and all of that. But obviously it's changing it. So now you've got people, you know, going straight to the, the art, or rather straight to the audience saying, please help me make this new record. You know, you can even be listed, you know, if you give X thousand dollars, you'll be, hell, you're, you're an executive producer of this album. So that kind of connection between the artist and the fan is, you know, again, something we never had, something we never had when I was a kid in the record store. But now there's Twitter and it's like, holy crap, I've tweeted with Chuck D of Public Enemy. That is the coolest like thing of all time. Like that kind of stuff is just like, <laughs> would have never have been able to do that. Not even back at, at the in college radio in the nineties. So even though with that right. was a lot more, a lot more connected because you kind of you realized, oh, these are a lot smaller bands and smaller labels, and those labels are calling up the station to go, hey, did you get the new you know package of CDs we sent you? And it became more, I guess it's it's just become more and more and more accessible for me and everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I have to a hundred percent agree. I mean, it's, it's really, it, it's, that's really crazy to hear that, that, I mean, I, I guess I'm surprised I haven't heard of someone kickstarting an album with a single track before. That sounds exactly like something that should, but duh, of course, why not? Duh, of course. So I, I, to, to the same degree, I think that's, that's, that's really, there, there's, a, there's many things changing and I, I don't want to, I don't know if I would say blame the internet or, or thank the internet, because I think it's more of the, it isn't the internet. The internet is the middleman again. So it's, it's the people on, on the, on the ends of it that are pumping, pumping data and getting data out. It's the tubes are useless by themselves. So like what direction do you, do you feel like the internet is kind of pulling music as far as going into the future? That's a good one. I mean, that's what's so genius about the way they named the program. They called it Garage Band. Brilliant, yeah. because that's now what it sort of is. It might not be friends, you know, bashing something out horrible in the garage, but it might totally still be that, and they're just recording it themselves into the computer. I mean, I think people earlier on were able to kind of sneer at the internet and go, yeah, whatever, and there's never been anybody made from... But then something like Arctic Monkeys happened. Dudes who basically made their own music, put it up, blew the F up and became one of the biggest bands in the world. You know, case closed. They were, you know, they're, they were made by the internet and they were made by the internet because they were fucking good. And they had been practicing in that garage for a long time and they had short, sharp, awesome singles and like a fine kind of British punk kind of style tradition. So, uh, you know, I don't there'll be lots more producers and there's a lot more kind of, I think a lot more people making a lot more music independently, a lot more independent labels that are able to sort of make it because again, you sort of are, you, they're going straight to the fan and straight to the fan of saying, Hey, if you fund us to the tune of this amount of money, we'll give you the record. We'll give you a t-shirt. And when we come to town, you get a ticket to the show and you get, you know, you get to come up front. I was actually, I was, I saw last, one of the last times I saw the polyphonic spree and they're one that have never, I I think that maybe they were on Hollywood records for a little bit, which is like a sub Disney imprint. But for the most part, they're on independent label and they get by on having the fans help support them on their encore. When I saw them once, they brought out these extra people from the back. I was like, who the hell are those people that get to go on stage and like sing with the band and the, on the choir stand? It's like, those are the people who paid some certain level on Kickstarter to be able to join the band when they came, you know, to your town. So, and, and to, and think that back in the day, you would just have to do a lot of drugs to get on the stage with the band. And now you have to pay them before the show even happens. So that's, that's pretty incredible. Actually. I mean, that's, that's a, I haven't even thought about that part of the internet transition but but that's that's interesting i'm sorry go go on man i'm sorry <laughs> i mean you know, i guess we're just the the way that it has sort of changed everything in that you know again bands sort of doing things for and with the fans which i, I think to me is mm-hmm. is a really kind of punk thing i now i mean is there do you think it's possible that like I mean, I'm sure in the past, uh, I, I don't know, I'm sure artists in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s 
at some point a band is big and at some point while that band is already big somebody uh moves up the chain of production into these different record labels and is a fan of those bands and it is this but it's like a corporate sanctioned version of the fans running the band do do you like have we kind of seen this before is it anywhere similar you think because it's like way more kind of voluntary like one way each way type transaction it's like a little bit more kind of insulated from from that i guess i'm I, I don't. I personally don't know that much about the the, the different labels and, and kind of how they work internally. But but are there any that that kind of uh, I don't know almost would be run by fans or or would potentially be uh, I don't know almost slanted in the opposite direction where where it's like the the people somehow running this seem to hate their freaking artists. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed in some of the because again I pay attention to it like a nerd. I. I I like flipping through, you know, a couple of offices at work, get in Billboard magazine. I love flipping through that because you can't get it on a newsstand, and it's filled with just music industry nerdery that, again, has the labels, has the numbers, has the stats, and all that kind of stuff that I kind of geek out on. And I've seen, you know, new label names over the last couple of years and go, oh, I wonder what that... It's like, oh, that was some... He used to be the president of Warner Brother Records. He retired from there and started his own new label. So in some way, it's like, yeah, that's an independent label, but it's still being run by a major label dude with major label connections and major label kind of money, basically. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, it's funny. You you said something about, you know, a fan-run label. And the only thing off the top of my head I could I first thought of was the Beastie Boys used to have their label called Grand Royal, and it actually it ultimately went out of business. And all of that, I think it was basically all coming up for sale. And I don't exactly know how mm. that happened. They were always on Capitol Records, but sort of... Once they became huge, it was one of those where it's like, it's Grand Royal and Capitol, like we own half of it. But at some point, all the stuff that they had put out on their own label, which is a bunch of, you know, a bunch of hip hop, a bunch of electronic, you know, I kind of I kind of collect the stuff on Grand Royal Records. And it's everything from Buffalo Daughter and Ben Lee and Atari Teenage Riot and At The Drive-In and a lot of different stuff. They were coming up for sale and a consortium of fans got together and pulled their money to actually buy and sort of save the Grand Royal archives so that they wouldn't ultimately get scooped up maybe by some other corporation. So the stuff that used to be on Grand Royal, I think, is now sort of on a fan-owned outlet. Interesting. That's that's GR2, Grand Royal 2. Hmm. That's that's really wild. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible that... I mean, I, I feel like certain things like that... The concern, you're right, as, as the... the music becomes dated or people start to learn about it. Um, I mean, the, there's obviously the interest is different necessarily from the, the point at which the album first came out over time. And, and a lot of it seems to be slightly influenced similarly to the internet by, by kind of copyright slash like broadcasting right type issues as far as is the music going to get locked down? Is it, are people not going to be able to play this or listen to this or share this when they once were able to, when they were originally intentioned to be able to, all of a sudden, boom, now it's owned by UMG and who cares? It's in the background of some other presentation for something else. And all of a sudden, boom, now this, this YouTube video gets a sweet ad. And, and like, I, I, I guess I'm <laughs> after having, after, especially after the first part of our conversation, you, you already kind of touched a little bit on, on this, but, but how, how do you know if a track is okay to broadcast? I mean, I like, is that really kind of like a renegade concern or, or, or how are you, I don't know. How do you, how do you, how do you know? I, th- I've always, I guess I've just always kind of approached it in a like shoot first, ask questions later kind of way, I guess, because every way I feel like I've done media, whether it's, you know, at a college radio station, well, we're broadcasting media. You know, it's sort of, I guess in a lot of ways, I look at it as sort of like, this is my job. Like, this is sort of what I do. And I've never actually gotten hit with any kind of, you know, take that down or don't share that kind of thing at all. Because I feel like for the most part, like you even noted, I try and bend over backwards to make sure that's like, here's the band, here's their link you know, here's the proper channel to go through to, you know, whether you buy it physically or on Amazon, iTunes, whatever, I don't care how you like to get music. 
here's the way to do it, and here's the band, and I'm excited about them, and hopefully you are too. So I feel like my sort of my motivations of it are are pure enough, hopefully, that I haven't gotten hit with any of that kind of stuff. But I know there's a there's a jazz station here in Portland, which there are not many jazz stations left in America. There's an awesome one here in Portland, and it's pretty much the only terrestrial radio station that I listen to. And there's a show in there, a, a weekly show, where they just play sort of old vocalists. And it's all sort of like crooners, and it goes through the 20s and 60s. And I, I love that stuff. I love, you know, I could completely just nerd out on all that kind of stuff. Um, that's what's fun about being a music fan. It's just, just kind of throughout your life, just like, oh, I like jazz now, or, you know, or whatever. But I, I've i met the host a couple of times, and I know I asked her one time, I was like, why don't you do a podcast to the show? She's like, and looked at me as if I was an idiot. This was like, I, all, the rights. I was like, oh, crap, she's right. With all of that kind of stuff, it might get popped in some way because probably the estate of Frank Sinatra is not going to be as cool as that band from Olympia whose song I'm playing on this week's show. So there is yeah. maybe by the nature of the kind of media that I'm involved in, hopefully more independent, more you know accessible community connection-wise. Hopefully, again, that's what's so exciting is to be able to play kind of big you know alternative and indie stuff and also super small when i look at you know i'll look at some you know some of the bands i play on pump up the volume i'll look i was like holy crap they've got less twitter followers than i do and they're a rock band <laughs> i and to yeah, get to have yeah. bands get excited and tweet back and be excited about, oh thanks for playing the track like that to me is like that's why i love doing this that's that's super cool, man. I and and you already kind of answered already my, my my next question, but it was <laughs> well partially <laughs> because I was I don't know I uh, was under the impression that that you I don't know you've got a pretty good background. You kind of know you're already pretty close to the broadcasting realm of broadcasting music, so you're you kind of know a lot of the the overlapping stuff. But it must. Like, if a track is first played somewhere on the radio, does it gain, like, a certain part of, like, it is public content? The toothpaste is out of the tube? <laughs> like, hey, it's already out. I brushed my teeth I mean, with it. It was already there. Fair. That's a good enough answer for me. But do, do you think that the... Do you think that the, maybe it would be a slightly different situation as far as maybe receiving these kind of, like, uh, like negative requests from for whatever reason, whether it's just kind of like a kind of like a friendly like, hey, we're the band, please don't play our music, or like any anything, any negative kind of feedback in in that regard. Do you think there'd be a different set of restrictions if you charged users to listen to pump up the volume? That's something that I've I, that I've thought about too. Sort of under the media monarchy banner, I like you know I do take donations, and some folks set up you know recurring monthly donations. I think I look at it as a way that I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to do it where here's pump up the volume and this costs you money. That I think would actually kind of get me in trouble and I would then be would kind of be incumbent upon me to then sort of share that with the bands. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think because for me it's just it's just it's another it's another show on the Media Monarchy channel. If you'd like to support the Media Monarchy channel, you can get all of these things that come out of it. Some of it is bands and music. Others are, you know, podcasts or blog posts or any other kind of, you know, multimedia. But I guess you're right because it's the music business and that's a bigger, you know, kettle of fish, as they say, and it's a bigger money kind of operation. So, no, I don't, you know, I couldn't, I don't think I could charge straight up for pump up the volume as it as it were yeah I, I was thinking about the same thing and i uh, firstly i don't know if it would really give the same exposure to the bands i which i th obviously i think it's a very good thing and i appreciate that a lot as far as far as just a tertiary kind of listener who's found it just on the internet like everything else it's 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 pretty beautiful that that I don't know you give it out for free and and I I don't know I don't know if you could charge for it either. Well, and, and you'll said, find some of the like some of the bands if it's like brand new songs and again like I said it's sort of oh this is the single or if it's not the single right. it's it's one of the songs you're kind of featuring before the record's out. You'll look on Spotify or iTunes or whatever. It's like oh this is the only song you can play. All the other songs are grayed out and and not accessible yet because the album isn't out. 
So again, I look at it as a way where it's like, I'm not giving anything away for free. Like, it's all right there. Yeah. The band gave this song out to, to gain promotion, and I'll link you to the iTunes page, and you can buy the record when it comes out next Tuesday. Yeah, man. No, that's it's it's really a cool thing. I I, I really really do do truly appreciate it. Um, are, are there any like particular like copyright concerns that you kind of have to be aware of in like your other life as far as the these these the one sans internet uh, or I guess I don't know augmented pre internet I don't know. <laughs> you mean, do you mean the, like the commercial radio day job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I feel like I <laughs> I feel like that gives me even more sort of bulletproof vest Mm -hmm. in a way that it's like this is an even bigger you know ball game in a way and this has Mm -hmm. like lawyers and shit that work for it and people (laughs) and people don't come here unless they're already like please can we talk on your radio station about our thing that's the thing i mean for the most part you know commercial media is you know it's a it's an insatiable beast that must constantly be fed with content and before you sort of, that's why I've always sort of taken from from Jello Offer, who's the lead singer of the Dead Kennedys. He's run his own record label, Alternative Tentacles, for decades now, and has always been someone I, I look up to as a as a media making model. But he said, you know, don't hate the media, become the media, and I've taken that on as Media Monarchy's sort of slogan or motto. What was my point? Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, just copyright and, and, and like dealing with that in, in terms of uh, oh, at the, at just the, commercial the radio. radio, commercial radio, before you kind of say, oh, you know, your, your media, you know, they're all a bunch of bastards and they cover up the stories. A lot of times they're just talking about what's been given to them to talk about. If you actually right. reach out and get in touch with your local station and send them a press release or they might come out and check it out because they just want content and stuff to be able to do. So mm. a lot of times there isn't necessarily some sinister agenda. It's just that someone else has given them stuff to talk about. And if that is coming from the well-connected, you know, government agencies who put out press releases, who then news stations all go on and all read the exact same thing, whether it's in Tucson or LA, you can watch those news clips, you know, the newscasters all saying the exact same thing. Because someone got them the press release. So I think, you know, working at a radio station, at a commercial radio station, again, most of the stuff, they want the promotion because you're going to be there out on the radio where tens of thousands of people are hopefully going to hear it and then go, ooh. Are, are, there, uh, are there any particular hacks? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a hacker in the, the colloquial sense of the term, but I, I very much appreciate the hacker kind of playful cleverness mentality. Are there any particular hacks that you could give to local bands to get kind of ex- seen or maybe like have a better shot at being exposed by a local radio station? Probably, I mean, persistence, definitely. And there's, right you know, on. bands send in, you know, you'll see local bands that send in lots of stuff. And sometimes it almost feels like the package that you'll get, it, it almost feels like they're trying too hard. And it's like, you're not going to trick me into thinking this is from a major label. So even though you've (laughs) spent and put all kinds of stuff into it, you can still look at it and kind of go, oh, that's a small local band trying to look big, packed with a a press kit and paper and all that kind of stuff. For me, a lot of the times it's like, what are the songs? What do you sound like? Like, that's the thing that's going to initially grab me. Then if I go look at you and then go oh, I, I like their style, I like their graphic design, or I like this or that other kind of aspect about it. I mean, for me, a lot of it, yeah, it's just I got to be turned on by the, the sound of it initially. Um, right on. So I, not, not necessarily the messenger, but the message itself and, and how is it and what, is, what does it sound like? And I mean, would you say they should like, Im- that like especially the smaller, like we're talking bands that are just playing in local bars trying to like even find out amongst themselves that they should keep doing this. Like they should kind of embrace the fact that they are that small. And especially if they are confident and like produce good music. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's at the end of the day, it's, it's probably even though all these things have changed and all the technology and all of this stuff for the most part, you know, unless on on the one hand, yeah, I go back to the, the sort of garage band thing, the program, one dude in a bedroom mm-hmm. can do a lot of stuff now. 
but the flip side, you know, mostly what they're probably doing is sort of more electronic-y. It's going to be stuff that'll be used in television and film and sort of meant to be used for other medium. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, the other side is, man, it's just bands playing shows. Play a bunch of shows until you get good, until people are like, dude, have you, like, there'll be local kind of, but like that to me is still kind of the tried and true way. And I've been mm -hmm. in Portland for 10 years now, and there were the huge bands that have already kind of been huge, and that's, you know, the Decemberists are from here, and Slater Kinney moved here, they're from Olympia, but all kind of Pacific Northwest bands. But in the meantime, since I've been here, there have been artists that it's like, oh, they're just slowly but surely doing their thing and playing a lot of local shows and keep you know the the name that i'm thinking of is sally ford there's a artist it, she originally had a band called sally ford and the sound outside she kind of dumped it was an all-male backing band she actually got rid of them and got an all-girl band and now it's just sally ford and she's on like her second record you know second or third album but she's just kind of kept slowly but surely at it and to me that's sort of the real like that's the real proof in the pudding way that you can sort of go up and play something and play a song and and sort of do it right then and there i guess and that yeah just the the ability and but it, but it really does come down to just the the music what does it sound like and 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 like, did you feel it? Can you like, is, is it that, is that kind of what you're saying? You think? think? Yeah. Cause for me, it's gotta be music that I dig the sounds, you know, sonically, it has to already kind mm -hmm. of appeal to me. Then, like I said, if I look it's like, Oh, and their graphic design is fucking kill. Like if it, ner if it makes me nerd out as a record geek, then that's the extra stuff that I'll okay. get, that I'll get hyped about and then get really, really into a band. But I don't know that I typically do it the other way. You know, I don't know that I do it the other way around. I probably don't stare at someone's album cover or design and be like, oh, that design, you know, I love that design, but I hate the music. I don't know that, I, you know, it doesn't really work that way for me, probably. So I, I have to admit, a prior to, truly prior to finding Pump Up the Volume, I was kind of a staunch advocate as far as like just kind of, I don't know, in in that douchey dude who likes music kind of way. I would only listen to full albums. I really, I really struggled to listen to single tracks because I kind of felt like the, the artist, they put the whole album together almost like a book and the track is just a chapter. And to just hear a single song, very often I'd feel like, what's the context? What came before? What came after? How, how is this like meant to be heard? And I, I, after, I mean, at an exposure level, a single track is a lot easier to kind of like scan through a bunch of stuff at an audible level. But, but like, I don't know, I'll find I'll have to listen to like a full album, maybe two or three times through looping before all of a sudden a track will catch me and it'll be like, Oh, what is this? Who is this? It's, this is really good. Like it all, I almost have to allow it to become like a noise before all of a sudden I'll really hook into something at which point then I'll like, then I'll start looking up the lyrics and I'll start listening to the tracks before and after and I'll kind of, it'll devolve into like, oh man, this album's freaking great. And then I'm telling everybody about it. But like, how, how do you, how do you listen to music? Do you, I mean, do you think it, that, that how, I don't know, your pat your, your experience and kind of like background has kind of influenced a little bit of, of how that, that goes? I, again, I probably have one one foot in in each camp because on the one hand, you know, behind me and like you see on New World Next Week all the time, I've got my vinyl shelves, which again, by its very nature, are for most for the most part albums. You know, mm -hmm. ten, twelve songs by a band put together like like you just kind of said as a book. But then on the other hand, maybe something like Pump Up the Volume is totally a product of now in that it is kind of like your iPod on shuffle because n nowadays. You know, we want to hear a lot of different kinds of music. I know, I mean, I know I do. And, you know, the argument has been made in some quarters is like, oh, well, the album as a whole or as a piece, yeah, maybe that's dead. Maybe it reached its peak with Sgt. Pepper and it's just been, you know, kind of going on ever since then. But of course, that's not true because there are always going to be bands who put together albums that totally go together like a whole. And I feel like the more, you know, the, the Run the Jewels album from, you know, it came out last October. It I was totally thinking the same has blown thing. up. But that one to me is, is, again, as I slowly like fell into it. But again, I'm quick to probably key in and go, oh, what's that fucking like? 
Okay. I hear something good. And so, and then can sort of slowly get into it. But that, I mean, that Run the Jewels record, it's almost set in like sets of four, I think. Is it, is it three sets of four or four sets of three? But the song, like, it goes together perfectly. It's sequenced mm. flow. Like, it's an album. Mm. You can listen to slamming songs by themselves, but it's one of those albums that it's like, oh, when I listen to that, I listen to it beginning to end because it's, because mm. it begs for it to be sort of consumed that way, so to speak. But then on the other hand, you know, there's just one-off kind of tracks that maybe that's all they're sort of meant to be. So I don't, again, sort of throw out one for the other. It just sort of depends on maybe what mood I'm in and what, you know, who are my favorite bands who, yeah, I'm always going to listen to their albums. But other artists, you know, oh, I like them, but I only like this kind of stuff or that kind of stuff. I've never really listened to their albums. You know, again, it probably comes a lot down to personal taste or, or whims even. Right on, man. No, I, I, that, that, I appreciate that so much, man. I, I, I've, I've similarly gone through both transitions that I still freaking love albums. I, I like, I, I really appreciate when an artist goes through the work to, to really put it all together like that. But, but um, that said, that's, that's, that's more questions than I actually had for you, man. I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, man. I, I really, really do appreciate it. Um, where, where can people find find your stuff? Where, where, where can people go to to get more get more of you, man? Well, the, the <laughs> shortest answer is always MediaMonarchy.com. And as the years went by, like I said, Media Monarchy to me was always the idea of an umbrella that could support my different sort of cultural interests and not feel like I had to be kind of pinned down to one thing. So I basically have built this whole farm of other websites because the idea was sort of to have, oh, well, I'll have someone that runs the new site about tech stuff, and I'll have someone that runs the site about food and health. And that was always kind of the idea, and again, I haven't gotten rid of it. But things have changed, times have changed, I, it's not happening as of as that is right now. So in a way, I'm almost kind of thinking of rolling it all just back into the main MediaMonarchy.com website because maybe I sort of realized, oh, if you know, I might actually, I probably am hurting myself having it spread out in all these different ways. So MediaMonarchy.com kind of is and will always be the main kind of spot because for you know, for better or worse, you know, you kind of realize, oh, well, this is going to be the thing I'm going to like whatever may come out from under it or next to it or somehow it's like, this is going to be my baby and I'm going to keep kind of working on it in some way, shape or form, whether I turn it into an LLC or hopefully I'm able to go, you know, kind of all the way, you know, with support, you know, that's, that's what I would continue to do. So mediamonarchy.com, that's the way. <laughs> Twitter, awesome. You know, yes. the other no, note actually, I, please, Twitter, everyone uh, go. Twitter is probably, you know, the, because as I got busier doing, you know, I basically produce other people's radio shows as my day job. And that takes away from the time I'm able to spend on Media Monarchy. So it got to the point, and it was a slowly but surely process. My Twitter account at Media Monarchy is the place that probably has the most up-to-date like news information. It has all the music stuff, all the video stuff, all the different things I'm interested in. And we'll have just whatever thoughts about news or snarky things or, hey, look at this cool, you know, comedian I got to meet at work yesterday. Twitter, my Twitter account is probably the most up-to-date spot for things going on as well. Awesome, man. Yeah, that Greg's, Greg Proops interview was great. Uh, I, th I think, <laughs> uh, yeah, always, always uh, a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. I, I really do appreciate it, man.